When I was about 10 years old, a story was going around school that Coca-Cola was so bad for your teeth that if you put a tooth in a glass of Coke, it would dissolve overnight. So when a tooth of mine fell out, I thought it would be fun to watch this happen. I left the glass overnight, then all day, and then a week, and the tooth still wouldn't dissolve. Now this should have told me something. If I'd asked the kids at school how they knew that a tooth dissolved in Coca-Cola, they probably would have said they'd heard it from other kids, and the other kids would have got it from other kids. And I would have thought, well, how the hell does anybody know? It was only years later that I learned the key to examining and debunking the floating pieces of fatuous information. Just ask the question, how do you know? Or to put it more specifically, what's your source? I thought I'd kick off this series about science and the media by looking at sources, because a lot of people have asked me about it. How do we know whether to trust the information we get? And where can we go to check it? You know, interestingly enough, uh, it harks back to uh, the early Persian Empire, about 500 BC. If you've ever fallen for this kind of barroom wisdom, don't worry. So do a lot of journalists. Recently, someone sent me a message about an odd assertion in the Daily Mail that a nuclear explosion on Mars 180 million years ago turned the planet into a dusty, rubble-strewn radioactive desert and that Mars is red because of this radioactive material. He was rightly sceptical and asked if there was anything in it. The story, of course, has now gone viral on the Internet. Now, it's no good going through volumes of journals trying to find out about the geology of Mars to prove this wrong. Just find out where the information comes from and start by looking through the Daily Mail story for a source. And here it is. The information came from an interview with someone called John Brandenburg on Fox News. So we Google John Brandenburg Fox News and here's the story. Now, how does Brandenburg know all this? Well, there the trail goes cold. There's no study and no research paper quoted, just one man's opinion. For most journalists outside the field of science, that's all they need. But science isn't like history or economics or medieval art. The facts in science are easy to source because they all come from research that's been laid out in peer-reviewed scientific papers. So let's see if Brandenburg has written one. The best database of published papers is the ISI Web of Knowledge, now run by Thomson Reuters. Google Scholar is also an excellent resource. And yes, a search comes up with a paper by Brandenburg called Evidence for a Large Natural Paleonuclear Reactor on Mars. But this isn't a peer-reviewed paper in a scientific journal. This was just one of over 1,800 papers submitted to the 42nd Lunar and Planetary Science Conference as matters of interest and discussion. The only other thing we have is a book by Brandenburg called Life and Death on Mars, and it makes some fairly extraordinary claims for what it calls the terrible truth, that Mars was once just like the Earth, with oceans and life and a civilization that was wiped out by that radioactive explosion. The Sidonian hypothesis was formulated uh, by us uh, based on the uh, photographs uh, from the Viking of what looks like the remains of a dead civilization, archaeological remnants. So despite the label science, the media have simply reprinted Brandenburg's speculation without the backing of any peer-reviewed paper. But what about that headline claiming Mars is red because of radioactivity? Surely everyone knows that Mars is reddish because of iron oxide in the soil. Well, not everyone, apparently. The Mail got its headline from a single line in the Fox News story. But the line isn't in quotation marks and isn't even attributed to John Brandenburg. In a recent radio interview, Brandenburg seems to accept that Mars is red because of oxidation, not radioactivity. I noticed that Mars' surface is heavily oxidized. In fact, if you look at the Velas Marineris uh, layers, they're bright red. I emailed Fox News to ask for a source in vain. But after a career watching badly written stories like this unfold, I've got a pretty good inkling as to what might have happened. Brandenburg probably told the reporter, John Brandon, that the nuclear explosion turned the planet red, meaning that it turned a lot of the iron-rich rock into dust and exposed it to oxidation. All Brandon heard was that the explosion caused Mars to turn red, and from his knowledge of the way radioactive material gives off a colourful glow in The Simpsons, he assumed this meant that the red colour was due to radioactivity. That's what happens when you let a writer with no background in science loose on the science page. 
Then an editor at the Daily Mail, equally ignorant of the difference between radioactivity and oxidation, made the blunder a headline. Between them, Fox News and the Daily Mail turned what was already unsubstantiated speculation into a wonderful pas de deux of complete stupidity. So the information trail is a bit like a Chinese whisper. As a piece of information gets passed along, it can get distorted. It could be because of a misunderstanding, or it could be intentional misrepresentation. The only way to be sure of how the information started out is to go in the opposite direction and follow the trail back to its source. And in my experience, however many people tell you something, the trail nearly always does end in just one source. Now, we can't do this with everything we hear, or we'd be hitting the books 24 hours a day. But we should be able to spot something that's a bit fishy. Again, in science, unlike history or economics, spotting something fishy is very easy. If a newspaper not renowned for fact-checking or accuracy makes a claim that's completely at odds with current scientific evidence, then either scientists are stupid, or they're lying, or the newspaper's got something wrong. As I've shown, the internet is a great tool for tracking information back to its source and finding out how it's been altered. But it's also good at disseminating bad information to millions. It's rather like a screwdriver. You can use it to take apart a complex bit of machinery to see how it works or why it's gone wrong, or you can stick it in your ear to see how far it goes before it meets resistance. Unfortunately, a lot of people would rather stick the screwdriver in their ear than undertake the simple act of undoing a screw. In my climate change series, I had the example of a claim that went viral over the internet that NASA said the sun was responsible for global warming. Millions of people believed it without doing the simplest thing, clicking the links back to the actual NASA story to read it for themselves. Once you follow the Chinese whispers back to their source, you can see where along the chain the story was changed. Sometimes the sources are incomplete, and that does make them harder to trace. One way to do this is to take a chunk of text that they've written, because they nearly always copy and paste these things, and put it in Google to see where it leads. You'll find the myth repeated many times, but someone somewhere will give a source as to where it came from. But I would always be suspicious of anyone who's trying to hide his source. Why don't they want you to know where their information comes from? A good example is Conservapedia's webpage, Counterexamples to an Old Earth, because it's a mixed bag. The first counterexample has a link that doesn't even address the claim, let alone support it. The second one offers no source at all. So this brings me to the next point. What do we do when someone says, a study shows, or according to a paper in the journal of whatever? Well, do exactly what I said at the beginning. Ask for a source, not just vague reminiscences. Most of the time when I ask this question, people can't tell me what study they're talking about or name the paper they're referring to. It's more likely than not they simply heard from someone that there is a study and took this claim at face value. Even if they can cite the paper, check it, because chances are, as with Christopher Monckton and his dozens of scientific papers, it's possible they're misrepresenting it or they haven't even read it. When Chipster07 posted a message on my video forum saying there was no correlation between CO2 levels and temperatures over the last 600 million years, I of course asked him for his source. The answer came back very authoritatively to researchers, Berner and Scotties, and a website. So I checked the website. It gives a link to the research by Berner and Scotties, so click again. Scotties has compiled a graph of temperatures over the last 600 million years, but gives no conclusion about how this relates to CO2 levels. So that source doesn't support the claim. Berner has compiled a graph of CO2 levels over the last 550 million years, and according to him, there is a correlation between CO2 levels and temperatures. So how can a website make a claim that completely contradicts a paper that's cited in support of it? Answer when the website is run by this guy. It's been proven time and time again and reincarnation breaks no physical laws as we know them. When Cliff Clavin expounded his knowledge in the barroom at Cheers, he had an audience of less than a dozen people. These days, Cliffy would undoubtedly have his own website, and to disguise the fact that it's written by a mailman, he can make it anonymous. Or he can give himself any title he likes and claim a specialist background he doesn't have. So when Chipster07 quotes Berner and Scottese as his source, he's taking the word of the equivalent of a guy he met in a bar. 
OK, there's a fancy website and it all sounds very plausible, but remember Cliff Clavin is only as good as his sources. Chipster07 never actually read Berner's paper, and neither did the guy who runs the website, or they both would have noticed that it says the complete opposite of what's being claimed. In the days before the internet, journalists did a lot of their initial research in cuts. Old newspaper clippings kept on file. I once spent hours trying to track down a myth that Tokyo gets hit by a major earthquake once every 70 years, and I finally tracked it down to a single wire agency story in 1970 that cited a research study, and was then badly misquoted. (laughs) The myth is still around to this day. The story survived because it was widely disseminated, and we do tend to believe what everyone else believes, journalists included. But it used to take years for stories like these to pass into general mythology, because at least most newspapers had editors who required facts to be checked, and rumours were generally spread by word of mouth. Today it takes just a few hours, and any debunking is always belated. The days when journalists had to get on a telephone and speak to someone or put on their coats and do face-to-face interviews and witness events with their own eyes. Sadly, that's taken a backseat to the click of the mouse. An editor I've known for years was moaning recently that our new journalists spend all their time on the internet. Our willingness to drive screwdrivers into our brains rather than unlock the truth has led to a culture of gullibility that's astonishing in even the most intelligent writers. I was misled by the internet, whines Christopher Booker, after admitting a quote he printed about climate change was a complete fabrication. Poor baby. Blaming the internet for your gullibility is like blaming the screwdriver for your neurological impairment. Science is often seen as a difficult subject, and yes it is, because it's detailed, meticulous, and demands the highest possible accuracy. But those qualities also make it very easy to check. There's a mechanism for documenting facts that has survived for 200 years and has given us all the technological achievements we enjoy today. But we have to be willing to consult it. Not everyone can, of course. Some papers aren't accessible without a subscription. Most are difficult to understand. So my advice is to go to the most reliable media on science subjects, which are the science magazines like Wired, Scientific American and New Scientist. I obviously have to declare an interest because I used to work for the last one. But from that experience, I know that if I was doing a story on microbiology, it would be edited by someone with a degree in microbiology. A story on nuclear physics would be edited by the news editor who has a PhD in physics. And a lot of new scientist readers are people who are specialists in their field, so the editorial staff know that any mistakes would be spotted and new scientist reputation would be at stake. Quality newspapers with science correspondents who actually have degrees in science are also a fairly reliable source of what's coming out of the scientific journals. Ultimately, the accuracy of what we believe is our responsibility, because where we source our information is entirely up to us. We can check the accuracy of stories ourselves and use reliable sources, or we can believe the Cliff Clavins of this world. You know, uh, recent medical studies have shown that... uh, Time zone transference, a.k.a. jet lag, not only can be very upsetting to one's metabolism, but uh, also directly correlates to the uh, loss of uh, hair follicles. Are you a doctor? No, he's a flume. 